Welcome to Survival Nutrition. I'll be your host, Mike Adams. I'm the author of Food Forensics and the owner of an ISO accredited forensic food laboratory. And this course is all about how to use nutrition to stay alive as we experience this global reset, perhaps civil war, definitely riots in the streets and all these crazy things that are happening right now. This is being recorded in September of 2020. And if you're hearing this on a video website somewhere, feel free to download the entire audiobook for free at survivalnutrition.com. Also, I've got two other websites that may be of interest to you. I've published another nine hour audiobook called The Global Reset Survival Guide. It's available at globalreset.news. Again, a free download of the entire audiobook plus a PDF transcript. And by the way, a PDF transcript is also available for this course, Survival Nutrition, and you can get that download for free at survivalnutrition.com if you don't already have it. Finally, I have another website called prepwithmike.com, prep meaning a short for preparedness or prepare. Prepwithmike.com brings you uh, videos, how-to videos, especially about firearms, survival gear, demonstrations, and solutions to help you stay alive during this very difficult time. But most people know me as the health ranger, and my focus has been health, nutrition, foods, and superfoods for over 20 years now. And with this course, Survival Nutrition, I'm finally getting a chance to put this to use in a way that can help people survive what's coming, which is going to include extreme food shortages, by the way. So let's just start out right up front here. What is this all about? What is survival nutrition? It's a lot more than just food preparedness. Everybody knows to store some food. And by the way, a lot of the food that people are storing is really toxic food, which we'll talk about, I think, in chapter three or four. But this is about more than food. This is about how to strategically use certain foods, nutrients, remedies, and even food-related chemicals and herbs to stay alive during a collapse or domestic war, a grid down scenario. And we're talking about extended periods of collapse. This isn't just about how to survive a, I don't know, a three day outage due to a hurricane or how to survive a tornado or how to survive, I don't know, a cold spell in the winter. This is about how to survive the collapse of society, at least some temporary collapse, perhaps lasting months, but potentially even years. And it turns out that in a collapse, your need for nutrition goes up. And this is the key point that underlies this entire course. You see, day to day, most people don't eat very well in terms of their food and, and nutrition. They eat a lot of fast food, a lot of processed food. And they get by okay because frankly, they're not working that hard physically. Most people don't have very physical jobs. Now, some people do, and they have to eat a lot more food, and that food's not always good for them either, so they suffer chronic health conditions. But most people in society today eat uh, relatively little now compared to what they will have to eat in a survival scenario. And why is that? Because in a survival scenario, guess what? You're doing a lot of things by hand, probably. You may be washing your clothes on a washboard with a plunger in a bucket of water and soap. You might have to make your own soap. You ever done that? It's labor intensive. You might have to grow your own food, which is very labor intensive. And most people don't know much about gardening or food production. In fact, they know so little that they will starve to death while gardening because they'll expend more effort trying to grow food than they'll get back from the food because they're growing all the wrong things. You can starve to death while growing celery and parsley, for example. You have to grow other foods that have a very high caloric return, such as tubers and potatoes and things like that. And we'll talk about that in this course. But it's even more than that. It's also about additional stresses that happen to you in a survival scenario, where you may be under physical stress and mental stress. You may be awake all night because you're I don't know, running a patrol for your community, or you've been under attack by roving bands of rioters or looters or something. So you may not get good sleep. You might suffer a lot of sleep deprivation. You may be wounded. And how are you going to heal your wounds? 
How are you going to handle an infection without the hospital and antibiotics and all those other things that people have grown used to in modern society? In this course, Survival Nutrition, I'll teach you nutritional solutions for all these things. And there's another aspect of this that's really important, and that's cognitive support. Because in a survival scenario, you need to be able to think clearly. You need to be alert, mentally alert, because dangers could lurk at every corner, right? Or there could be someone stealing from you as you're trying to uh, buy groceries or, or other goods at, uh, I don't know, some kind of a barter location set up by your local town or city. People may be trying to attack you. They may be trying to kill you. You might have to flee a situation, which gets into physical health and cardiovascular recovery as well. But just on the cognition side of things, you need to be able to make very good decisions. And frankly, day to day, most people, because they're poisoned by toxic food ingredients and poisoned by toxic medications, most people don't make good cognitive decisions. And that's just every day in society. People are horrible decision makers. And in good times, when you're not in a survival scenario, making bad decisions doesn't necessarily cost you your life. But in a collapse, in a, an SHTF scenario, as we say, when it all hits the fan, a bad decision can get you killed. And so brain support, cognitive function is key to this. And we're going to cover that in this course as well. So it's everything from natural antibiotics and first aid to nourishment, nutrition, how to produce high calorie foods that are also healthy how to choose the right nutrients, how to choose the right foods for storage, how to store them properly so that you don't have them ruined by even rodents and pests or oxidation and so on. There are many things we're going to cover in this course that will help you survive and a lot of things that I think will surprise you because many of the most important things are very simple, but people tend to not think about them. A lot of people store large amounts of food and large amounts of toilet paper. And it's really not surprising if you read the ingredients on the food they're storing. Those are foods that cause a lot of diarrhea and you know, bad digestive effects. So suddenly it makes sense why, why they have a, a shopping cart full of toilet paper at the local Costco. Yeah, maybe they know more than we think they do. They're planning ahead because they've stored a bunch of horrible foods. Well, I'll show you in this course how to store very inexpensively, in fact, food that will keep you alive. And a lot of this is learned from experience. I've been many places around the world. I've lived in many other countries. I lived in South America for two years. I spoke nearly fluent Spanish at the time. I lived in Taiwan. I speak Mandarin Chinese at a basic level now. I've been to Europe and Australia and, and Hong Kong and China and Singapore and uh, Peru. I've hiked the Andes Mountains up to Machu Picchu. And in all these places, I've observed what usually low-tech, low-income people did for their own stored food. I mean, I've observed the high ele elevation sweet potato farmers in Peru that are essentially plowing fields with uh, beasts of burden, like a giant ox with a wooden plow. And uh, what we call the Indian people in uh, high elevation Peru, you know, with the, I don't know what you call the hats. They're kind of like the black hats and they have the very colorful sweaters and vests and so on. They have a very unique uh, style of dress and they're out there working the farm fields. And I've been there in person because I've done those hikes myself up to high elevations <laughs> where, where I was out of breath as well. Uh, even though I was uh, in uh, plenty of good shape at the time, but the, the local people there, they're built for that high elevation exertion. But they taught me a lot of things, a lot of observations. For example, if you're hiking through the Andes Mountains, what do you bring for food that's very easy to turn into food? Well, they brought quinoa and eggs and salt. And out of those three ingredients, you just catch water in a mountain stream, and then you, you have a, a small campfire. You boil the water, you put the quinoa in it, it expands tremendously. You add the eggs, kind of like egg drop soup, 
and you throw in some salt and you've got a very delicious high protein source of food that can keep you going as you're hiking through the mountains. And it doesn't take a lot of weight to carry that around because quinoa is very, very light. But when it absorbs water, obviously it expands tremendously, much more than rice, proportionally speaking. And so you don't carry the water with you. You get the water from the stream. And that's how you hike around the Andes Mountains and, and stay well fed while you're burning 5,000 calories a day, maybe more. But we'll cover these kinds of things. And I'll bring you a lot of benefits of experience and mistakes that I've made, as well as lessons that I've learned all over the world. When I lived in Ecuador, at that time, I was growing about 70% of my entire diet. I had a food forest in Ecuador. It grew tropical fruits, uh, everything from mangoes and papaya to cherimoya and many other things. And we had uh, yucca root plants, so we made yucca soup all the time, maybe a little too much. I've had way too much yucca soup in my lifetime already. But yucca is easy to grow, or I guess in English you would pronounce it yucca. Uh, but I'm used to calling it yucca because that's the uh, you know Spanish uh, pronunciation of it. So yucca is easy to grow, and there are many things that are very easy to grow depending on your climate that can produce fruits very quickly, where, where you don't need to wait you know eight years for a, a pear tree or a pecan tree to start producing fruit. You can have fruit in one year with a fig tree or a kumquat tree can produce kumquat fruits, which are a natural source of vitamin C and anti-cancer nutrients in the kumquat uh, peels, which are edible. Those can produce fruit in one year. So there's things that you can do now, even if you feel like you're late to the game, you could go buy a, a one foot tall fig tree and you can plant it. And in the right climate, that can be a 10 foot tall tree in one year, producing loads of figs. And then you can learn how to dry the figs if you don't already know, and you can have dried figs, which are a great source of uh, calories and obviously sugars and sweetness. But you can combine that with things like, believe it or not, uh, dried meat or bacon or jerky. You can have, I mean, I think it's even a delicacy in some restaurants, bacon wrapped figs. And it's uh, this combination of fat and sweetness and uh, richness, lots of minerals, but also endurance from the protein in the meat and the fat in the bacon. And and by the way, if you're not a meat eater, there are going to be plenty of things here that are vegan or vegetarian. This is not at all about eating a lot of meat. In fact, most of this probably isn't about meat. Where appropriate, I'll mention it. So that's kind of a quick overview of what you're going to learn in this course. Now, I'm going to get to next here the, the three problems that most people have when it comes to nutrition and survival. But first, let me just share a little bit of background in case you don't know uh, who I am and what my experience is. As I mentioned up front, I am the author of Food Forensics, which was at one point the number one best-selling science book on Amazon.com. I'm the owner of CWC Labs, which is an ISO accredited mass spectrometry laboratory for food forensic analysis and food testing. I'm the founder and owner of HealthRangerStore.com, which is an online retailer of foods and superfoods and certified organic storable foods and essential oils and many other things. But what's unique about us is that we lab test everything that we sell. So we quarantine all the raw materials as they come into our warehouse in central Texas. And then we sample everything, take it to our lab and run heavy metals testing. We run glyphosate testing. We run microbiology tests, including E. coli and salmonella a total plate count, yeast, and mold. And then for other types of foods, depending on the, the food or supplement, we run additional tests. Uh, for milk, for example, or, or dried milk products, we'll run the bovine growth hormone tests. For spirulina, we'll run radiation tests just to make sure there's no you know, latent radiation in it and things like that. So we do this very comprehensive laboratory testing and almost everything we sell is certified organic and we don't sell anything that's genetically modified. We don't use any artificial you know, substances, no artificial fragrances or preservatives or, or food coloring or any of that garbage. Even in our laundry detergent product and our dishwashing detergent product and our body soap, and I think we have a toothpaste coming out soon, these are very meticulously crafted to be completely free of artificial chemicals or synthetics or pesticides or heavy metals. So that's what we're known for. 
But in doing this over the years, I started a, a laboratory, I think it was in 2013, in fact, when I started the lab, we had to purchase ultimately what became millions of dollars worth of laboratory testing equipment, uh, mass spectrometry equipment. We've got, for example, what's called a triple quad mass spec, which does organic chemistry, pesticide testing, quantitation analysis. I can tell you if there's one part per billion of glyphosate in your beer, for example, that's how sensitive it is. Or I can detect one part per billion of lead or mercury in your rice protein from China, which is usually very contaminated, by the way. Or we can find arsenic in seafood products, which is very common. Or glyphosate in lentils and oats, which is also very common. Or lead in turmeric root powder, which is very common. And so over the years, I've had to be trained on all of these instruments. I've had to learn quite a lot about organic chemistry and also uh, inorganic chemistry, which is uh, elemental analysis. And we've seen thousands and thousands of samples of foods because we are buying foods and we're selling foods. We're buying them sometimes 50,000 pounds at a time with big rigs coming into our warehouse in Central Texas and unloading pallets and pallets of food ingredients, everything from you know, black beans to oats to quinoa to rice, all kinds of things. And because of this experience, I've had a unique view of the food industry, what's clean and what's polluted, what the supply lines are like, and some of the games that food raw materials providers will play with people like us. They'll try to deceive companies with uh, fake credentials, fake certificates, fake organic certifications, and so on. So I've gained some very unique experience that I'll share with you here about how to get honest foods and superfoods and supplements and how to make sure it's clean and then how to store it and use it in a survival scenario. And it's not very common to find scientists like myself, I'm a published food scientist, who is also a survivalist, so to speak, or a prepper, but that's what I am. And that, that experience is what I'm going to share with you in this course. Now, just adding this thought in the context of you know, who I am and, and my science background when it comes to food forensics, I'm always searching for truth about what's in food. You know, I promote organics. Over the years, I've tried to teach people to avoid pesticides, which are neurotoxic, by the way, and to avoid GMOs and avoid heavy metals and so on. This endeavor has not made me popular with anybody, certainly not the pesticide manufacturers, but also not the storable foods industry, which relies almost exclusively on genetically modified, partially hydrogenated, you know, soybean oil and derivative products from GM corn and so on. So there's something about our society today where truth tellers are vilified and liars are celebrated. So people out there who lie to the world and say, oh, we've got the, the most amazing food. It's dirt cheap, but it's perfectly good. It's, it's all non-GMO and it's got a shelf life of 25 years. That company is going to get a lot of business because they're lying to people. Their foods are actually GMO and the shelf life is probably only two years, not 25 years. But since there's very little regulatory enforcement of those claims, they get away with it and they get a lot of business. And they can just lie to people. Most people don't read the ingredients. So when someone like me comes along and does the testing, it's like, oh, wow, there's a lot of glyphosate in there. Or your rice has arsenic in it. Your lentils are contaminated with glyphosate and so on. Then uh, you know what? People don't like to hear that. They really don't like to hear it. So it's very rare to find somebody in the world. And this is even true in politics. I mean, there's no one running for president that stands up there and says, hey, by the way, America's broke and we printed way too much money. The dollar is going to collapse at some point and all the savings that you have in dollars will soon be worthless, right? Vote for me. That never happens because it's not a popular message. People like to be lied to by charlatans in many cases, it turns out. Political charlatans or storable foods industry charlatans, or I guess in some case, you know, survival industry charlatans or whatever. I mean, people, I mean, people really do demand to be lied to because it's easier for them to handle the deceptions rather than the truths of the world, because truths are very inconvenient. Truths are difficult. It's hard to shop for clean food. It's hard to buy organic all the time. It's hard to get it right. 
on every front. It's hard to navigate political claims and decide who's telling the truth and who isn't. So these things are difficult, but I've made it my mission to discover the truth using instruments of science in many cases, and then to publish that truth on my main website, naturalnews.com, which is, of course, viciously attacked by the genetically modified seed producers and the pesticide producers and so on. But that just kind of goes with the territory. So what you're getting here is a, a very rare observation about healthy foods and honest foods that I don't, I don't think there's anyone else in the world who does what I do in terms of being both a prepper and a food scientist and also, you know, a firearms expert having gone through 5,000 hours of firearms training over the years, which I've covered in the other course, the global reset survival guide. There, there really aren't very many people like this and certainly none of them want to go public and talk about what they know because a lot of the things that I talk about are not politically correct. For example, saying that most storable food is genetically modified processed junk food that's lower quality than typical prison food. That's not a statement that wins you friends in the food industry. So most of what's going on out there in the industry is an effort to get people to shut up and don't talk about the dirty little secrets of survival food or food storage or what's really in these herbs, most of which are from China in many cases. You wouldn't believe how much of the food and supplements and herbs come from China. Now, for example, just here's a little tidbit. A lot of companies that are retailing supplements to a U.S. audience, they will say that their supplements are made in the USA. That's what's on their bottle, made in the USA. But guess where the ingredients come from? Oh, communist China, which is heavily polluted with toxic heavy metals. In fact, we currently reject about 80% of the lots of food raw materials that we test. And it's even higher, maybe 90% or maybe even more. If we ever look at something from China, which we rarely do, but sometimes we'll, we'll get materials from China that a reseller wants us to look at, and they're almost always heavily polluted. But these supplement companies, they'll buy toxic materials from China, dirt cheap, loaded with lead and arsenic and cadmium, and then they'll have an encapsulation contractor in the United States that makes the product in the USA, which means encapsulating it. So they'll add a flow agent, typically what's called MCC or microcrystalline cellulose. It's just a, a white powder, basically wood pulp that's dried. They'll add that as a flow agent, and then they'll encapsulate the cheap Chinese herbs into capsules in the USA. And then they'll sell that at Whole Foods or wherever. And on the bottle, it says made in the USA. The average customer thinks that that means the ingredients in the bottle came from the USA. They think, oh my gosh, this must be U.S. farmers. This must be really clean food because U.S. has you know, environmental regulations and farming regulations and so on. Made in the USA must be good. No, it's cheap Chinese crap, heavily contaminated with toxic substances that's just encapsulated in the USA. So it's all deception, you see. And I've probably got a hundred stories like this to tell you that are all true, that would all blow your mind. For example, USDA organic certification, I don't know if you knew this, does not encompass heavy metals. So you can have a USDA certified organic product, anything, wheat, corn, sugar beets, whatever. It can be totally contaminated with lead and it can still be certified organic. And the grower never has to test it for lead ever to receive the organic certification. Why is that? Because the USDA just doesn't have the scope of heavy metals as part of its certified organic program. You know why? Because the USDA organic program is run by powerful food corporations that have lots of dirty little secrets, such as heavy metals contamination. And you know why that is? You know why? Why are the farms contaminated with heavy metals in America? Because everywhere across the country, people flush toilets with their poo in it. I'll keep this polite. And all of that human feces goes down the sewage system and it gets collected in the sewage treatment plants where it's called biosolids. They dry it out a little bit and then they load this material into trucks. And to get rid of it, 
cities go out to farmers outside the cities, obviously in the rural areas, and they say, hey, Mr. Farmer, would you like free fertilizer? We have a high nitrogen biosolids product we'll give you for free if you will let us just spread it on your farm. And the farmers who don't do their research on this because they're busy growing food, obviously, they say, well, yes, we'll take your free fertilizer with nitrogen in it. And the city people go, great. And then so they load up trucks with human sewage and they spread it on the farms. And these are the farms where the cows feed. These are the farms that grow your, your orchards, almond orchards in California or pears, pear orchards in Washington state or apple orchards or whatever, fruits and nuts and even vegetables all across the West Coast. Well, I guess it's really everywhere across America, but that's that's sort of the food center of America, the Central Valley of California. And it's all irrigated with sewage water, by the way, and it's fertilized with human sewage. And guess what people flush down the toilet? Not just their poo. They flush all kinds of other things down there. Not to get gross, but, you know, condoms and tampons and such, and this ends up on the farm fields. Very common. Any agricultural worker in California will tell you they're going through the field and they're planting or, or weeding or whatever. It's not uncommon to find all of these crazy things that people flush down the toilet. But also they get light industrial waste from you know the light industry businesses such as uh, car mechanic shops and dental offices and so on. And guess what? They're flushing down the drain. Oh, mercury from mercury fillings. They're flushing lead down the drain. They're flushing arsenic and cadmium. So all of that gets concentrated in what I call bio sludge. And then the bio sludge gets spread on the farms. And then the farms produce the food that people are eating, not knowing what's in it. And this happens all across America. I, in fact, I've interviewed numerous experts on this, including an EPA whistleblower who was fired for doing the research on this. <laughs> what a story. Uh, that documentary is available for free. It's called Biosludged. And you can download it or watch it at biosludged.com. It's just an incredible true story about the toxins that go into the food supply. But most people have no idea that this is happening. And if you're still listening, you know, here we are 30 minutes into the intro, you're still listening. I'm willing to bet that you've already heard three or four things that just totally shocked you things that you never knew were true. Like you thought maybe certified organic means clean food. Doesn't at all. Or you thought made in America supplements use ingredients that are grown in America. No, it doesn't. That stuff's all grown in China. And you probably didn't know that human sewage is spread on farms and goes right back into the food supply, right? So let me hit you with one more thing. And I'm not trying to gross you out here, so suppress the, the gag factor on this, but Washington State has legalized the liquefaction of dead human bodies to be put down the drain. It's, it's perfectly legal, and it's a new way to dispose of the dead. And so they liquefy the dead, and they put them down, down the, the municipal sewer system with chemicals, and then that goes into the biosludge that gets spread onto the farms in Washington state, which is where your apples and pears and nuts and vegetables come from as well. And so they're literally liquefying the dead and feeding them to the living, which is a line right out of the matrix, which at one time was believed to be a science fiction movie. Now it's actually law in the state of Washington. Yes, you can look it up. It's, it's true. So this is some of what you need to know. If, if you're going to prepare food for survival. You need to know what's in your food. You need to know where it's coming from. You need to know how to get clean food and how to store it. And also how to navigate all of the lies of the food industry, which is steeped in all kinds of deception, I guess, as is every industry, pharmaceuticals, vaccines, pesticides, you know, weapons of war, whatever. Seems like every industry is full of corruption, right? But so is the food industry. There's no exception to that in the food industry. So you're going to learn a lot in this course, and I will have many more interesting tidbits to share with you. But let's move on now to the problems that most people have 
when it comes to nutrition and foods in the context of a survival scenario. The first problem that people have, most people, is they fail to prepare. They don't even make an effort, much less listen to this course and and become expert in your level of knowledge about foods and herbs and and survival and preparedness and so on. They don't even have an extra box of craft macaroni and cheese, which I don't even consider to be food anyway. But they don't even have that. I mean, the, their their cupboard is so thin, they can't survive a weekend without going to the store and buying more things. Some people just eat at restaurants all the time, or at least they used to before you know, COVID-19 lockdowns closed most of the restaurants. So people are living kind of hand to mouth, literally in this case, with their, their meals. They don't typically practice long-term storage. They don't understand the basics of food rotation, which is you know eat what you store, store what you eat, eat your oldest stored food first so that you're always constantly rotating your food storage. That's a obviously a basic rule of food storage. You probably already know that. I'm not even going to bother mentioning it, it again because it's kind of self-evident. But people don't even have that, so they fail to prepare. And then, of course, they panic when things go wrong. And they're like, oh, the grocery stores are empty. You know, this happened during the COVID lockdowns in certain parts of the country and around the world. Grocery store shelves were empty because of the food shortages and the meat plants getting shut down. And I don't know, millions of Americans couldn't buy their pork ribs or something. So they were totally freaking out because they didn't have stored quinoa <laughs> to, to live on. The second mistake that most people make is they stock up on the wrong things, things that don't have shelf life, and they fail to properly store them. So when the average sort of clueless, oblivious American stocks up on food, and when I say American here, I also mean you Canadians too, by the way, because you know, I mean North Americans, okay? So you're in the same boat. A lot of Canadians as well, they stock up on the wrong things. But Americans will go to the grocery store and they will buy Pop-Tarts. Like, oh my gosh, there's going to be a, a storm? Better get extra Pop-Tarts, you know? Now, Pop-Tarts are nutritionally worthless. Pop-Tarts are barely even food. There's almost zero nutritive value in Pop-Tarts. I mean, it's just what? Sugar and corn syrup and processed bleached wheat flour that's completely devoid of nutrients and a bunch of artificial colors and <laughs> little sprinkles on top. I mean, what is that? Just colored sugar bits. There's nothing in there that's going to keep you alive. I mean, that's not even food. Pop-Tarts are entertainment for your mouth. It's not food for your body. It's just going to promote hypoglycemia and maybe blood sugar swings, especially for people who are type 2 diabetic, right? And, and by the way, there are going to be a lot of diabetics who find that there, there's no insulin in a collapse, so you're going to have to change what you eat. You're not going to be able to live on donuts and ice cream. You know, you're going to have to figure out a, a different way to live to control your blood sugar, which is mostly vegetables and raw foods, nuts and seeds and, you know, simple grains, unprocessed grains like, well, quinoa, which is sort of a grain, but not exactly. We'll talk about that later. But the average food that people go stock up on is not really food. I mean, yeah, they'll load up on a bacon with sodium nitrite in it, which causes cancer. You know, the sodium nitrite ingredient, it's a cancer-causing chemical that's found in processed meats, but people will stock up on that. And they don't even know that the way to stop those from causing cancer is to take vitamin C with it, so they don't have vitamin C. And so you'll see people who have a freezer full of toxic, processed meat and no vitamin C and a cupboard full of pop tarts, but no actual nutrition anywhere in their kitchen. And they'll tell you that they're prepared and they're not. I mean, they've got wonder bread, which is aptly named, I suppose, because I often wonder, is that bread? It, 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 this is, there's no nutritional value to it. You see, I, I can't even, when I am at the grocery store, which is not that often, but at times when I'm there and I observe what's in other people's carts, I can't even believe they're still alive. I mean, I'll see, here, here's a typical scene in Texas. There'll be a Latina mom who's clearly obese and diabetic with uh, two or three kids who are out of control, climbing all over the place, yelling and screaming because they're living on sugar and soda. And sure enough, I look in the shopping cart and what's it full of? Oh, sugar and soda. 
you know, Lucky Charms cereal, processed homogenized milk, cases and cases of soda, like frozen pizza, the, the, the cheap, crappy kind. It's just this stuff isn't even food. But the average person then, when, when they, they realize they have to stock up on foods because something's about to happen, such as a civil war or a storm or, or the power grid's gone down or whatever, they will just increase their purchases of the same crap that's killing them right now. So the people who have diabetes and cancer and heart disease, because of the toxic foods that they've been buying, now they'll just go out and stock up on the same foods that are giving them those diseases in the first place which is where colon cancer comes from, by the way. It's just, wow, you're, you're coating the inside of your colon with cancer-causing chemicals. What? Gosh, shouldn't be any surprise that cancer develops, right? It's because we do live in a world of cause and effect, right? But this disconnect exists in the minds of most people who don't realize that the foods they eat produce the health effects that they're experiencing. And sometimes the doctor will tell them, well... Yeah, you have diabetes, but it's not your fault. Runs in your family, they'll say, like it's genetic. Yeah, because your mom and dad drank soda and ate sugar and taught you the same thing. That's why you're diabetic. It's not genetic. It's learned self-poisoning. See, again, just, just as a little disclaimer here, I don't make these audiobooks politically correct. This is about telling you the truth here. I hope that those listening are not offended by this truth. If you happen to love your Pop-Tarts, you might be disgusted by now, but <laughs> you, you can decide what to do. It's your choice. I'm not going to be your, your food police here, but you do need to realize there's cause and effect at play. And I'm not going to try to coddle you and making you feel good about your diet if your diet's actually killing you. So I'm going to point out throughout this entire course, things that are toxic in the food supply so that you can avoid those things. And then I'm going to give you solutions of things that are nourishing, which is the real point here. For all the reasons I already mentioned up front, you have to nourish your body, your immune system, your brain, your heart, your fitness level, everything. If you want to survive, you're in a competition here called survival of the fittest. You know, that's who survives hard times. It's people who are the most adaptive, the most fit, the most prepared. And that's not going to be Mrs. Latina grocery shopper with the soda packs and the, and the hyper kids living on sugar bomb cereal. That's not who's going to survive this. So I'm just sort of saying it like it is, okay? That's all. But let's move on to the third problem that most people experience in all of this. And that is they just lack knowledge about how to use foods to survive, how to prepare foods to survive, how to stretch the food supply, how to combine foods that you're growing with foods that you've stored, how to combine nutrients in a meal in a way that stabilizes your energy and provides you know, sustainable pr uh, productivity for the entire day if necessary. People just lack knowledge. They lack knowledge about essential oils, knowledge about herbs. Most people don't know you can grow your own antibiotics, for example. And it, when I tell you how to grow your own antibiotics, you're going to say, oh, it's that easy? Really? Yeah, it is. You can grow antibiotics. <laughs> in fact, if do you live in a place where there's a yard? Do you have anything growing in your yard? Well, if so, you're already growing antibiotics in your yard. And, and here's how you know that's true, because you've heard that soil has microbes in it, right? All soils have microbes. There's all kinds of different colonies of microbiology, bacterial strains and viral strains living in the soil. And you know that plants have roots that go into the soil, right? So I'll ask you this, why don't the microbes in the soil eat the roots of the plants, including maybe grass or dandelions or weeds or what have you, or trees? How do trees live? If there's microbes in the soil, why aren't those microbes eating all the tree roots? Guess what the answer is? Because trees produce antibiotics. Grass produces antibiotics. Weeds produce antibiotics. They all produce it because plants can't go to the pharmacy, so they have to become their own pharmacy. So they synthesize all of these very powerful molecules to kill off or defend themselves against microbes in the soil that would otherwise try to eat them. <laughs> That's, so antibiotics are all around you. You've just been taught 
brainwashed really by the fake news media and big pharma. You've been brainwashed to think that medicine only comes from a pharmacy. No, that's fake medicine. Real medicine is all around you, everywhere around you, all in nature, in the tree leaves, in the tree bark, in the seeds, in the pollen. <laughs> I mean, the roots, the flowers, plants produce medicine or they would not survive. So there is natural medicine all around you. It's incredible that we as human beings, we live so disconnected from the world that we came from. I mean, we co-evolved with mother nature all around us. We are compatible with the foods and the plants that grow in the ecosystems that we inhabit. And yet somehow we've been taught that food comes from a factory and medicine comes from a pharmacy. Those are both fake ideas, but that's the lack of knowledge that I'm talking about. The average person doesn't have any knowledge about food or medicine or even how their body works. You know, the average person can't point to where their adrenal glands are, and they've lived with those glands their whole life. They don't even know where they are. They don't know where their thyroid is located. The average person doesn't understand how digestion works or what's the role of the gallbladder. I mean, people live in bodies that they don't even understand. It's weird. It's like owning a car and not knowing how to drive it or having a, a radio, but no owner's manual. You don't know how to operate the radio. People live in their bodies. They don't know how to run their own bodies, you know, except for the obvious things, uh, entertainment, masturbation, sex, whatever. I mean, yeah, people do figure those things out on their own. But for actually understanding how the body works, the digestion, neurology, immunology, physiology, all these things, they're clueless. It's like they're alien in their own skin. It's weird. It's, it's like they're visitors from outer space inhabiting human bodies that they know nothing about. <laughs> and, and actually, for some people, that might be literally true, Mark Zuckerberg. But, you know, I'll throw in a little humor from time to time. Maybe you don't think that's funny. You're like, no, man, that's real. Yeah, okay. I think he's a cyborg, not an alien, by the way. Half, half human, half Borg, something like that. But that's beside the point. You've got to become good at knowing how your body works and how it interacts with food and nutrients and herbs. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to survive what's coming. You know, people talk about even common terms like antioxidants. What is an antioxidant? What role does that play in your body? Why do you need a certain amount of antioxidants? What's bad about oxidant that needs to be antied? You know, well, we have to talk about that in this course, and I will a little bit, not going to get too crazy technical, but you need to understand the basics of human physiology. Like here, here's a, a very important concept. I've covered this in other podcasts, but I'll review it here. You know that I think most people know that, well, maybe people don't. When you urinate, you know what makes your urine yellowish? It's that you're urinating out former red blood cells, you know, well, red blood cells that are dead and able to be eliminated from the body. That's why your urine typically is a little bit yellow. If you exercise very strenuously, your urine will get darker and darker. And if you really kill yourself with exercise, you might urinate something that almost looks brown. Those are your red blood cells dying off and being stripped away by your kidneys and eliminated through your urine. Well, if you're eliminating red blood cells all the time, which you are, if you you obviously would die if you ran out. You, you can't live without red blood cells. So that logically means your body must be making them, all right? So your body's making red blood cells all the time. I guarantee you the average person in America, plus you Canadians, has no idea that blood cells are made in your bones for the most part. Not only in your bones, but for the most part in your bones. And you ask a typical person, like, well, where do red blood cells come from? They're like, I don't know. Usually a, a typical uninformed person will say, well, they must be made in your heart because that's that has to do with blood. They know at least that much. The heart and blood kind of go together. The heart is a pump. They've seen that in cartoons or whatever. So they think maybe the heart makes red blood cells. No, it's made in your bones. But here's the key. How are they made and what are they made of? And <laughs> this is where people get insane. It turns out the average person, even if they understand that red blood cells are made in your body, they think it's made by magic. Like you have a magical blood cell factory that just sort of teleports red blood cells into existence. 
And that's not at all what happens because we don't live in a magical bioverse here. We actually live in a cause and effect universe based on human physiology. Turns out your body has to build red blood cells with the hemoglobin and everything. And hemoglobin is a miraculous molecule, by the way. We probably won't get into that, but it's pretty cool. It's like a molecular transformer. In one form, it carries carbon dioxide away from your cells so you can exhale that toxin out of your body. And then it transforms into a way that's like an oxygen magnet picks up oxygen out of your lungs, which take this quantum leap across lung membranes into your red blood cells. And then your red blood cells carry that oxygen to living cells in your body. And then they kind of catapult the oxygen into those living cells. And then they transform again to carbon dioxide carrying molecules. This is some cool stuff. If you're kind of geeky like me, it's really cool. Hemoglobin is one of the miracles of modern life, but they are manufactured. They're made. They're made of, you know, hydrogen and carbon and oxygen atoms and whatever else goes into them. I haven't brought up that molecule in a while on the screen to look at it, but it's a pretty big molecule and it's got a lot of atomic elements. Now, here's the question. What is hemoglobin made of? Now, here's the question. What resources does your body use to make blood? And if you think about this, again, you ask someone on the street, you're like, okay, if you convince them that their body is actually making blood, because at some point they will have to join in that conclusion, okay, I give up. Yes, the body must be making blood. Otherwise, we would all be dead. What is it making blood out of? And the answer is... It's making new blood out of things that are in your current blood because it's the blood supply that goes to the bones that feed the blood making factories that assemble new blood molecules such as hemoglobin and red blood cells and so on. But it's made out of stuff that's in your blood because where else would it come from? You can't be making blood out of stuff that's teleported from an alternate dimension. You're not making blood out of, you know, magical fairy vortexes that are in your body or something like that. You're making blood out of stuff that's in your blood, right? That's just a logical step. Well, what's in your blood? What, what does your blood consist of? And the answer, I'll save you the, the leap here. The answer is, of course, stuff that you've been eating and drinking and putting on your skin and absorbing. So your blood consists of things that you eat and drink and absorb. And also to some extent, what you inhale because that goes into your blood too, obviously. So it means the new blood that you're making is made out of the stuff that's in your current blood, which is made out of the stuff that you're eating and drinking and absorbing and inhaling, which means that the quality of the new blood that you're making depends entirely on the quality of these things that you're eating and drinking and absorbing and inhaling. And what are most people eating and drinking and absorbing and inhaling? Garbage, 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 garbage. Sucking on cigarettes, eating toxic processed foods, drinking a bunch of sodas and alcohol and absorbing toxic chemicals from the toxic laundry detergent they use because they think it makes their clothes smell good. No, it's actually causing liver cancer. So the average person's blood is so toxic, and I don't mean to be gross about this, but if humans were a source of food in America, even the USDA would reject the carcasses as unqualified for human consumption. <laughs> I mean, like, you'd, you'd rather eat a cow. I mean. The USDA would stamp approved on a cow carcass, but rejected on a human carcass because humans are filled with so many toxins. It's just, it's outrageous because of what they eat and drink. And what does this have to do with survival? Well, it all comes back around. So everything that you need to do in the context of survival, which is wound healing, cognitive function, you know, what feeds your brain? Your blood feeds your brain. Your brain is powered by what's in your blood blood glucose, for example. Well, what's your blood made of? Again, everything that you've been eating and drinking and absorbing and inhaling. So the function of your brain depends on the things that you're consuming. And if you're consuming crap foods, i.e. Pop-Tarts, macaroni and cheese, you know, smoking pot all day because you want to chill, then your brain function is going to be, frankly, retarded. I don't mean that in a condescending way. I mean, like a medic medical way, the retardation of cognitive function. That's what's going to happen. And can you survive in a mentally retarded state? Probably not. Although I'm sure there'll be plenty of people who try. They will be obvious because they will be the ones who are dead. Not a good way to survive. So 
everything that you take into your body becomes the building blocks of everything that physically exists in your body that runs your immune system, that runs your heart, that runs your brain. Your heart is powered by fuel in your blood, just as your brain is and your digestive system, your muscles, your tendons, your skin, your eyeballs, everything. So nutritional survival should be a fundamental subject of every person who exists as a human being, because you have to learn how to run the body that you are currently inhabiting in case you plan on leaving it at least leave behind an owner's manual for the next soul <laughs> that, that takes it over. Or in the case of certain evil people, the next demon that, that infests their body, I guess that must be weird. Demons coming into people's bodies, possessing them and showing up and like, Oh my gosh, this, this body's full of toxins fits right in for some of those demons. I would imagine they're like, yeah, feels like hell in here. <laughs> it's like very familiar, but for the rest of us, we should, attempt to attain more of a godlike body of, of health, you know, more divine nutrition, nutrition based on light, not darkness, health, not sickness, you know, joy, not suffering. So survival nutrition is about so much more than food. It's about having harmony with your body in a way that, that promotes sustainability, survivability, adaptability, this is way more than just a simple course about how to make it through a societal collapse. This is about how to survive the rest of your life in your body, because that's probably where you're going to be, I would imagine, unless you have some weird, you know, trading places kind of uh, technology where you remember the old Eddie Murphy movie and Dan Aykroyd trading places, right? Switching bodies. Yeah, that was fiction. I don't think that you or I are ever going to experience that. So we're going to have to learn to live in the bodies that we have. So all of this knowledge becomes really critical for surviving in these bodies. That's what this is really about. So in summary, this course is not just about food, nutrients, and herbs, and raw materials that you can acquire and deploy in, uh, based on strategic principles of survival, but it's also about long-term survivability even when your body is under attack by biological weapons or infectious diseases or physical assaults or physical injuries or stresses of our world or, you know, chemtrail poisons, toxins in the food supply, toxins in the medicine, pharmaceuticals, mass medication, uh, just every kind of poison that you can imagine, toxic fragrance chemicals in the laundry detergent. This is about how to survive all that as well, not just a collapse of society. But you'll find that the skills and knowledge that I present here are universal across all of those scenarios. Because if you learn how to stay alive in peace time, let's say, and you, you really master this information, you'll also be able to stay alive more easily during difficult times. The truth is most people aren't even surviving peacetime. Most people are dying right now. They're dying with every bite of toxic food that they put into their bodies. They're dying with every prescription medication that they swallow. They're dying with every load of laundry that they do that's full of toxic cancer-causing chemicals. They're dying all the time. And that's why they look dead. So many of them walking around like zombies uh, with the coupons at the grocery store, 50 cents off macaroni and cheese, TV dinners, like zombies, because they're, they're barely there. They're already kind of leaving their body because the soul is, is like, get me out of here. Can't stand this. This is, this is crazy. So when you really experience maximum health, as I'll teach you how to do in this course, you'll find that your soul becomes more enlivened as well. You have more connection to yourself and connection to nature, the world around you, connection to God, even connection with divine principles. You are more awake and alive and aware. And this has everything to do with survival. Because believe me, if you're in some zombied out state of some medicated, you know, bouncing off a of sugar high now, you're depressed and angry, you're all moody and everything because you only stocked up on, you know, pop tarts and corn dogs, your, your soul doesn't even want to be there. Survival is not really very likely in that situation because you're already half dead. You know, you can't, we can't talk about survival unless we stop killing ourselves first, right? That, that should be the number one point of this course. 
And people are killing themselves every day with every meal, with every medication. People are killing themselves. People are suicidal. And uh, they almost have some kind of pride in it. Like, oh, today I drank, you know, 12 beers and I ate three pizzas. It's like, what are, do, do you think this is a competition? Are, are, you, are you expecting a medal? I could bring you a participation trophy, perhaps, if that would help. But we might want to get you a colon cleanse. You know, uh, I, I don't know what it is that that people are trying to do with their health, but it seems to me that most people just want to destroy themselves. No, and I mean that literally. I, I think even psychologically, maybe some of you listening are psychologists or psychiatrists, perhaps. And I think if you dig down into the layers of most of your patients, don't they all just ultimately want to just kill themselves? Like if they could just bring a gun into your sessions and just put a gun to their temple and pull the trigger that that would actually be your ultimate solution. They're just too cowardly to do it. They really just want to kill themselves. And so they go out and they, they attract bad relationships and they have, you know, bad sex with risky partners and they, they have uh, horrible food habits and you know, they, they just burn themselves out. Why? Cause they hate themselves. They would rather die. Well, the way to turn that around, at least part of the way, I would say, is you got to fix what's in the blood that's powering the brain. By the way, this is the missing gap that, that psychologists and psychiatrists don't normally understand. And I don't, I don't mean to put down psychologists. They perform a very valuable service for society. But it's kind of like at some point, if your patient or client is angry and moody all the time, you might want to ask, what are you eating? You know, what's wrong with your physiology? Why do you have these blood sugar swings? You know, what substances are you abusing? <laughs> what, what heavy metals are you putting into your body that's causing this violent, aggressive behavior? You know, lead, lead causes aggression and violence, by the way. It's a well-established fact. You know, copper causes people to become schizophrenics. And the gap that psychologists have often is that they're always trying to solve things by talking about it. Oh, we're going to... Peel away the layers of your id, and we're going we're gonna to do this therapy where you imagine this and that. Well, maybe the person just needs to stop poisoning themselves and eat healthier. And guess what? All those problems will go away, or at least a lot of them. I'm not saying their, their bad family memories or whatever they're dealing with are going to go away, but their ability to handle that will be so much more resilient when you've got good nutrition. Adaptogens. You know, I'm talking about foods and herbs and molecules that have adaptogenic properties that help reduce inflammation throughout your body, but also give your neurology more resilience when needed. Adaptogens, plenty of foods and herbs that fill that role. And that's what's missing, it seems, in our society. And don't even get me started on teachers that like to drug all the children with ADHD drugs. Uh, oh, you're too hyper. You're you're learning too fast. You want to go outside and be in the real world. Must be something wrong with you. Let's drug you up with toxic medications so that you will be obedient. Oh, look, little Johnny's sitting there, numbed out, drugged out in a, in a state, a zombie-like status. Oh, he's the perfect student now. Now we can indoctrinate him with public school brainwashing. You know, that's considered a success. And that's part of the problem with our world, of course. What little Johnny really needs probably is a better diet and some playtime outside. Gee, imagine that. But school lunches are, are crazy toxic. That's for sure. But these are some of the things that we're about to get into here, okay? So this is just the introduction so far. I just I wanted to give you a, a taste of what you're about to, to learn here and kind of explain where I'm coming from on all of this. Survival of nutrition is about so much more than you might normally think. It's about surviving your entire life in the body that you live in and using nutrition to achieve that. That's what I'm an expert in. And that's what I'm going to share with you throughout this course. So this is the end of the intro chapter. And just a reminder, if you don't have access yet to the other chapters, just go to survivalnutrition.com and you'll be able to download those chapters for free and including a PDF transcript of all of it. So I think you'll enjoy that as well. And feel free to spread the word on this because I'd love for more people to get this information and to get healthier as a result. That's my goal. 
And if you want to see my other websites, as I mentioned up front, go check out prepwithmike.com. That's about preparedness solutions, including firearms, by the way. I'm, I'm also well-versed in firearms. And you can also get my other audio book, The Global Reset Survival Guide at globalreset.news. Those are all free resources for you. So thanks for listening so far to chapter one. We'll move ahead with chapter two, which is myths of nutrition. Why everything you think you know about food is probably wrong in the survival context. So we'll get to that next. Thanks for listening.